Anatomically modern humans originated in sub-Saharan Africa 300,000 years ago. Genetic and archaeological data indicate that anatomically modern humans primarily remained in sub-Saharan Africa until the out-of-Africa expansion of modern humans within the past 75,000 years. During the out-of-Africa expansion, a small group of anatomically modern humans migrated from sub-Saharan Africa and populated the rest of the globe. This paragraph was from a peer-reviewed 2023 genetic study, but collapses under even minimal scrutiny. The statement claims an exclusively sub-Saharan origin 300,000 years ago. However, it then cites the Jebel Irhud early Homo sapiens of Morocco, which you may know lies outside sub-Saharan Africa, and is explicitly used to argue for a pan-African evolutionary process. The paragraph then compounds the error by asserting that modern humans primarily remained in sub-Saharan Africa until 75,000 years ago, a date that does not come from archaeology or fossils at all, but from a narrow set of decade-old genetic studies that used Yoruba populations of West Africa as a proxy for all Africans, artificially erasing North Africa and the Levant as irrelevant to modern human evolution. This is circular reasoning dressed up as evidence. A late split is inferred by choosing a modern West African reference population, then retroactively declared proof that nothing meaningful existed north of the Sahara before 75,000 years ago, despite abundant fossils, archaeology and continuity in North Africa and the Levant hundreds of thousands of years earlier. The paragraph is not a synthesis of data. It is a narrative sleight of hand that cites a pan-African fossil model to argue the opposite, substitutes population genetic shortcuts for archaeology, and turns a methodological assumption into a historical fact. What is presented as settled evidence, in reality, ignores the scores of fossils and modern human sites from Morocco to the Middle East, dated from 400,000 to 75,000 years ago. In fact, an exclusively sub-Saharan origin for Homo sapiens has increasingly come under fire, even by mainstream archaeologists. And so with these discoveries emerged the notion that there was in the past somewhere, maybe in East Africa, a sort of restricted Garden of Eden, where in a, a sort of biblical way, suddenly, around 200,000 years ago, uh, a fully human creature, like us, uh, emerged and then later expanded. And this view that prevailed for a long time has been challenged by many discoveries this uh, past few years. The out-of-Africa theory was never neutral. It is Eurocentric. It was built on a false assumption that because Cro-Magnon man appears suddenly and conspicuously in Europe around 40,000 years ago, modern humanity itself must have evolved shortly before that moment. Cro-Magnon man can trace his roots back to the eastern Mediterranean over 100,000 years ago, and not Africa. Indeed, that the number of fossils outside of sub-Saharan Africa dwarfs the number of modern human fossils within sub-Saharan Africa. Europe before 40,000 years ago was an evolutionary backwater compared to the modern humans in the Levant and southern Mediterranean, who were already making shell jewellery, practicing sophisticated burial rituals, including use of red ochre and grave goods, and crafting sophisticated compound hunting spears 150,000 years ago. The early Homo sapiens fossils of the Levant and Morocco seem to be isolated until you realize they form a Mediterranean metapopulation stretching from Greece to the Strait of Gibraltar. For whatever reason, the absence of dramatic archaeological visibility north of the Mediterranean before the Upper Paleolithic was transformed into evidence that nothing comparable existed elsewhere. The Levant and the wider Mediterranean were treated as peripheral way stations, their long records of continuity reduced to a series of failed migrations, while Europe's late fluorescence was elevated into a global turning point. The Levantine Homo sapiens are said to have disappeared after 80,000 years ago, but they didn't disappear. They relocated as sea levels fell and the climate cooled, but now those sites have been drowned. So how on earth could equatorial Africans migrate north into this landscape 75,000 years ago? This was the absolute worst climactic window, and it lines up precisely with the Toba super-eruption, which caused rapid cooling in the northern hemisphere. 
A migration from sub-Saharan Africa during this time is biologically absurd. Long before Cro-Magnon appears, fully modern humans already occupied a broad arc stretching from the Maghreb through the Levant. By at least 130,000 years ago, populations associated with Skul and Kafza in the Levant were burying their dead, using ochre, producing shell beads, and hunting large game with carefully planned, hafted weapons. These were not marginal experiments. They were stable expressions of a fully modern behavioural repertoire. They were not proto-anything. They had already arrived. According to the single out-of-Africa migration story, the Levant spent 100,000 years being accidentally inhabited by a few confused Africans who wandered north, invented burials, jewellery, ochre rituals interbred with Neanderthals, and then mysteriously vanished just before the real modern humans finally showed up. Apparently the Levant was continuously occupied by failed dispersals for 200,000 years, an impressive archaeological record for a place no modern human was really living in. Out of Africa, fanatics tried to make it work by saying that there was a sort of revolving door of Homo sapiens dispersals and extinctions in the eastern Mediterranean, with Neanderthals filling the gaps. But both populations are using the same tools, have similar burial practices, occupy the same caves, and hunt the same game. Geographically, this is incoherent. Demographically, it is implausible. Archaeologically, it is unsupported. Logically, it is irrational. At the same time, Atlantic Morocco hosted the Aterian, a technological system centred on explicit composite weapons. Aterian tanged points were not simply stone tips that happened to be hafted. They were engineered for insertion into shafts from the outset. Stress was transferred into the shaft, tips were replaceable, and weapons were designed for repeated use. Supported by advanced Levallois and Nubian blank production, the Aterian represents one of the earliest fully modular hunting systems known anywhere. These behaviours did not arise independently in isolated pockets. They formed a coherent package, distributed across regions linked by coastlines, river corridors, and open savanna environments during interglacial phases. North Africa, the Levant, and Arabia were not peripheral zones waiting for Europe to awaken. They were the primary arena in which Homo sapiens stabilized modern morphology, social signaling, and technological planning. Europe, by contrast, sat at the cold, unstable fringe of this system. When Europe finally warms and stabilizes after roughly 45,000 years ago, several things happen at once. Population densities increase, mobility corridors reopen through the Balkans, Anatolia, and the Mediterranean coast. Groups interact more frequently and over longer distances. Cultural traits that had existed elsewhere for tens of thousands of years suddenly become visible, durable, and archaeologically loud. The result is the familiar Upper Paleolithic signature. Diversified tool industries, rapid stylistic change, ornaments, figurines, cave art, and dense site distributions. From within Europe, this looks like an explosion. From a broader perspective, it is a threshold effect, the point at which cultural accumulation finally outweighs cultural loss. Nothing in this pattern requires a new brain, a new mutation, or a sudden cognitive awakening. The anatomy of Cro-Magnon reinforces this interpretation. Early European modern humans are tall, long-limbed and high-vaulted, with reduced brow ridges and faces that look strikingly familiar when compared to Levantine fossils. Cro-Magnon skulls align far more comfortably with Levantine school Kafsa populations than with any hypothetical African precursor. This is exactly what we would expect if Cro-Magnon represents the westward extension of an already stabilized population, rather than an abrupt evolutionary leap. The differences that do exist, robusticity, cranial breadth, facial proportions, fall well within the range expected from admixture, climate adaptation, and local demographic history. They do not signal a new species or a new cognitive grade. They signal regional expression within continuity, if Cro-Magnon is reintegration, Manot Cave is the hinge on which that reintegration turns. Dated to roughly 55,000 years ago, the Manot skullcap occupies a critical temporal and geographic position. It appears after the school Kafsa population fades from the Levantine record. Morphologically, 
Manot is unmistakably modern and closely aligned with earlier Levantine Homo sapiens. It does not look transitional in a primitive sense. It looks continuous. Crucially, Manot overlaps chronologically with Neanderthals in both the Levant and Europe. This places it within the same broader population system that produced early admixture events and maintained contact zones. Manot demonstrates that modern humans did not vanish from the Near East for tens of thousands of years, only to reappear suddenly. The corridor remained occupied. The system endured. In this framework, Manot is not an out-of-Africa pioneer. It is out of the Levant, a reservoir population maintaining continuity between the southern core and Europe. Morphologically, Maladek and Cro-Magnon do not signal a sudden evolutionary break. They look like the European expression of an already stabilized Homo sapiens form, shaped by local adaptation and modest admixture, but fundamentally continuous with Levantine and Mediterranean North African populations. Indeed, this is why the Upper Paleolithic appears explosive in Europe. It is not because humans suddenly became modern. It is because Europe finally crossed the demographic threshold required to preserve complexity. The decisive advantage held by Cro-Magnon populations was not intelligence. It was risk management. Inheriting projectile-oriented weapon logic, ultimately rooted in Aterian composite systems, modern humans reduced injury rates, shortened recovery times, and increased survivorship. Fewer injured hunters meant more elders, more knowledge retention, and faster population growth. Even small differences in adult mortality compound rapidly over generations. A population that loses fewer people while doing the same job will expand, even if both groups are equally capable cognitively. This is how Cro-Magnon outcompetes Neanderthals. Not through brilliance, but through logistics. Once Cro-Magnon is understood as an extension of a Levant North African system, the entire Upper Paleolithic narrative shifts. Europe no longer occupies the center of human innovation. It becomes what it always was during the late Pleistocene, a peripheral zone that periodically reconnected to a more stable southern core. The explosion dissolves into a demographic phase change. Art, ornamentation, and stylistic diversity emerged not because humans suddenly became symbolic, but because enough humans were present to sustain symbolic traditions over time. Cro-Magnon was not the dawn of modern humanity. It was Europe's arrival into a world that already existed. The behaviors, technologies, and morphologies that defined the Upper Paleolithic were old by the time they appeared north of the Mediterranean. What was new was Europe's ability to hold on to them. Manod shows the corridor was occupied. What once looked like a revolution is in reality reintegration made visible, and the realization that the original Out of Africa story said more about Europe's archaeological visibility than about where modern humans truly came from. Ironically, Skull and Kafze were excluded as Cro-Magnon ancestors on the grounds that they overlapped with Neanderthals an argument rendered obsolete the moment it became clear that overlapping with Neanderthals is exactly what our ancestors did. The out-of-Africa theory speculated that there was no interbreeding, that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were incompatible species, and modern humans all descend from a small, isolated sub-Saharan African population that only left Africa recently. From about 200,000 to 50,000 years ago, Europe was a difficult place to live. Ice sheets advanced repeatedly, habitats fragmented, and effective population sizes remained small. Neanderthals were highly successful under these conditions, but their success bred conservatism. Heavy thrusting spears, close-range ambush hunting, and robust toolkits were effective strategies in cold, seasonal environments dominated by large and dangerous prey. These were not failures of intelligence. Neanderthals lived inside the adrenaline state, modern men pay money, take risks, and build sports industries to briefly experience. Long pursuits, cold exposure, hunger, all push the same endorphin dopamine feedback loop that modern endurance athletes chase. Simple technology were solutions optimized for risk minimization in harsh ecologies. Where overly complex technology could put you at long-term survival risk. Yet, the same conditions that favoured Neanderthal robustness worked against cumulative cultural complexity. Small, isolated populations lose innovations as often as they generate them. 
Teaching chains break. Apprenticeships shorten. Technological templates drift. Systems that require standardization, modularity, and long learning curves, such as composite projectile weapons or sustained long-distance exchange, struggle to persist. This is not a cognitive limitation. It is a demographic constraint. The archaeological record does not preserve potential. It preserves retention. Europe's apparent simplicity before 45,000 years ago reflects not an absence of modern behavior, but an inability to stabilize it. Modern humans did not suddenly burst from Africa in an ancient manifest destiny and conquer all of Eurasia in a few thousand years. They were already there. Thanks for watching.